Welcome to Victorious Living with Pastor Charles Cowan. Now let's join Pastor Cowan and the congregation of Faith is the Victory Church. This is Victorious Living. And so he said, let me read for you again and we'll move on. It's, uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord protects me from danger. So why should I tremble? And so we see then that salvation is the saving grace of God and the saving protection from God for our lives, even in the midst of all of this that's going on where this virus is concerned. So the word why, why is a question word within those three little letters, W-H-Y, why, within those, there, there, is, there is a cause or a reason for which something is happening. Why is this happening? That's, that's the question. Why is this happening? Or you, sometimes you, you hear people say like this, why is this happening to me? Why, and, and now even in this virus, just, just today I saw, why has God brought this virus against, uh, against us and against people in other nations? Well, the truth is he didn't. He didn't do that. God didn't do that. God's not out to destroy you. He's out to save you. And uh, then why should, I, why should I be afraid? I shouldn't be afraid because God is my salvation through Christ. And so I get all of that, the reason for why I shouldn't fear in my mind as opposed to why I should fear. And so I use the word, I use the word to drive that fear out of there, to drive that uncertainty out of there, get it out of my mind so that in the midst of all that's going on, I, I rely on God. And I know that God is my, my protector. I know that he is my salvation. So the word why is a question word. It's a word that has a question in it. It is a question word concerning the cause or reason for which something is done. Why should I not be afraid? The reason is because of what Christ did for me in his, in his death his burial, and his resurrection. So that's the answer to the question, why I should not fear. And so we see then that the answer to why always goes to trust. If I, if, if I trust the Lord, that he is my salvation and that he is my protector from the evil that roams in the earth, why then do I not trust him? So the, word, the answer to why goes to God to, to trust. Do I trust God and what he said in his word concerning me? So that's the answer that we give when the word why pops, pops up there. And then there's another question that pops up out of there. Will God do what he said he would do. Well, now here again comes, comes this why, comes this why. Well, the reason that God won't do what he said he would do is because look what you've been doing. Or he will say, look what you haven't been doing. And so he, he just tries to mingle and, and mesh this and that and the other and just come up with something that'll strike your mind and bring uncertainty, fear, and doubt into your thoughts and into your thinking. So the answer to why comes to this. Do I trust God? Do you trust God? Well, you say, well, I, I do trust God. I know he's out there. I, I believe he's up there. Uh, and I, I do trust it. But now here's how you know if you really trust God, do you trust what, what his word says? Do you trust the writings of the scriptures? of what we know is the holy word of God. Do you trust what God inspired by the Holy Spirit, the writers 
of the scriptures, of the canon of the scriptures, do you, do you trust that what they penned in, in your Bible and in my Bible, do I trust that as being a word from God? Well, now a lot of people say, well, you know, that's just a religious book. There's a lot of them around. And he, you know, he goes to the different, uh, different books of different re religions and what they go by. And so we know then that the word of the Lord is, is eternal in its nature. It is truth in its nature. It's power in its nation, uh, in its uh, nature. Uh, and it is so many other things that we can mention that is in the word of God because God's word is full, F-U-L-L, -L, full. It is full of power. It is full of ability. It is full of protection. It is full of God's saving grace. When we read it, it's full of all of that. So you see sometimes how the devil plays the game. He puts all of these circumstances around, it, around us and says, no need for you to read the Bible. No need for you to believe the Bible. No need for you to think God's going to do anything good for you. You know how you've been. You know how you acted. But one good thing where that's concerned is this, that God is merciful. God is loving, has so much love and kindness. And the blood of Jesus ever stands in, in heaven tonight at the mercy seat. And Jesus is pleading his blood right there and making intercession for us. So I have every reason to be encouraged. I have every reason to, to look at my future and see it bright. I have every right to look at my future and believe that I'm going to have a better future than the, than, the, uh, than the success I've had in the past. I'm going to have that because God said I could have it, because made it possible that I could have it. I believe that. I take that word off of the pages of the Bible. I put it into my thinking, into my mind, into my soul, my heart. I put it in there, and I believe that he told that he inspired the prophets of old and the apostles and the writers in the New Testament. I believe that God, by the Holy Spirit, inspired them to write that. So look what the uh, look what numbers. I'll read to you Numbers chapter twenty three and verse nineteen. I want to read to you uh, what that verse says. Now, remember, it was penned by men who were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God and penned what the Holy Spirit was bringing from God to them. They wrote it down. This verse, we'll read it to you now. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man. Okay, God is not a man. So there, there is something that goes along with that statement. God is not a man. Now watch what he, what he says, that he should lie. He's not one that should lie and did not lie. God is not a man. God, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Now watch that. He's not a man that should lie, or we can say it this way. He's not, a man, not, uh, he's not a man who would lie. He can't lie. He doesn't lie. And, and then he goes on to say that he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent. What does that mean? What God inspired the writers of the, of the scripture, God's not gonna repent and change his mind. God will not repent from what he has said. God will not repent of any word that has come out of his mouth. And so therefore, God will not repent of anything that's written in the, in the scripture. I am the Lord thy God, he said, and I change not. I am God. God is, he is the incorruptible God. And he is the God that will not lie, should not lie, could not lie, and he will not repent. So if God says that he's my protector, that's who he is. If God says he is my provision, that's who he is. If God says that he'll bless me, that's what he'll do. If God says he'll uphold me, that's what he'll do. If God said I'll be with you in trouble, that's what he'll be. If God is with me in trouble, he said I'll deliver you 
out of all of your trouble. That's exactly what he would do. I trust him. You can say that to yourself there, here, and there at, the, at your home, house. You can say, God, my father, I trust you. And so if I say I trust him, I must trust his word. I must trust what he has said. I must embrace what he said into my belief system, into my believer, into my heart. I must embrace what he has said. Amen. So he, he, uh, Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Hallelujah. That's, 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 I'll tell you, that's real assured. I mean, that's good assurance. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. He's not going to change his mind. He'll love you forever. And he's not going to change his mind. I mean, he will love those who, who leave this earth not having accepted him as their redeemer and savior, but that's not going to keep God from loving them. He loves us irregardless of, of whatever our life, what direction our life is gone. He loves us, but yet he doesn't approve or agree with everything that we may do in life. But he loves us. And he said, I will not repent from what I have said. So God loves me. That's why I can say it with assurance tonight. That's why I can say it with a lot of liberty and freedom. That's why I can say it loudly. God, you love me. God, you care about me. God, you protect me. God, you provide for me. God, you have given me your peace. I can say that tonight, not because of, of, a, of a feeling that I have, but simply because it is written in the pages of the Bible and God will not uh, repent of what he has said. Amen. So God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he not said it? Has he not said and shall he not do it? Well, the answer to that is he'll do it because he won't repent from what he said when he told you he would do it. He won't repent from that. So what? That he should repent. Let me read it all to you again. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent or that he needs to repent. He don't need to repent because he doesn't change. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken and shall he not make it good? I tell you, folks, you can build your house on that. You can build your house on that. That is solid rock. Uh, so far as God's concerned, that's solid rock to build your life on, for us to build our life on. So we thank God for the, uh, for the immutability, the unchangeableness, of his word that I can rely on in the good times. I can rely on it in, when things may, be, may not be so good around me. I can rely on the unchangeable, uh, incorruptible God that I have placed my hope and placed my trust and placed my love in him. Amen. Now, when you get back over onto the, to the dark side where Satan worked and roams, and that brings fear and uncertainty, as we've already mentioned to, to us. Fear is a dark shadow that ultimately imprisons its victim. Let me say it again. Fear is a dark shadow. The darkness of, the, of Satan's kingdom brings a, uh, it brings a dark shadow and wants me then to, to, to bite into that so that I give a, a, a dark shadow to the word where my faith and my believing is concerned. So fear is a dark shadow that ultimately imprisons its victims. Satan brings thoughts of, of, of fear to us through circumstances uh, uh, to modify uh, uh, in an attempt to change the truth into a lie in one's mind. Now, let me, get, let me read that again. <laughs> Satan brings thoughts of fear to us through circumstances. All right, now, what are circumstances? A circumstance can come to us through a word. It can come to us through a phrase. It can come to us through a sentence. It could come to us by something 
that's happening in the natural realm. All the circumstances can, can invade our thoughts and thinking from all of these things. So let me read for you again that Satan brings thoughts of fear to us through circumstances, through a word or a phrase that we hear or a sentence that we hear or something that's happening in the natural. What are we going to do? We're going to know this, that God is our salvation. God is our protector. God is our provider. God is a good God. And so uh, Satan brings these uh, circumstances to, in order to, to uh, uh, you know, make us or cause us to modify and, and attempt to change the truth to make it sound like that God's not telling you the truth, that God has told us a lie. Well, what we just read, read over here, God's not a man that he should lie. He's not going to lie. He's not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. So Satan brings circumstances. And I want to say it again. He brings circumstances through a word you hear, through a phrase you hear, through a sentence you hear, or something that's happening in this natural world around you to modify your thinking, to change your thinking, to modify your thinking in attempt to change the truth of God into a lie in our mind. That we come to the place where maybe God didn't tell the truth. And we, maybe, maybe God uh, didn't mean to say that. Well, we, we wiped all that out just in the few verses that we have read here tonight. Fear operates in many different ways. There's a lot of different ways that fear operates and when it starts to get that thread of it in your mind, I mean, he can move that thing all over your mind. Fear operates in many different ways. Fear of rejection. Boy, a lot of people over, over my experience uh, in ministry over the years, there is a fear of rejection. There's fear of change. There's fear of misunderstanding. There is fear of uncertainty. There is fear of sickness and disease and even fear of physical death. Now, there's other ways, but those are some of the major ways that Satan uses fear to influence our life or to influence uh, what we experience in life or to influence uh, uh, our receiving of what God has provided for us where blessing is concerned in Christ Jesus. So, so I want to say that for you again, that fear then, uh, uh, there's a fear of rejection, there's fear of change, there's fear of misunderstanding, there's fear of uncertainty, there's fear of sickness and disease. Oh, is it present today with this virus? Sure it is. You know, it's just, it's just rampant out there. And Satan's trying to get us to buy into it, not even giving a second thought to his salvation and his protection that he's provided for us through Christ. And so we know this, the only way to face fear is not to cope with it, but to be liberated from its deadly influences. And you see people today, I do, maybe we all have it sometime at some point in life. You see people doing their best to cope with what's going on in their life. They're trying to keep their head above water. They're trying to just make it from day to day, trying to make it from week to week, never knowing what's going to befall them out there in their, in their mind, in their thinking. So they're just going to cope. And you hear what you hear it said. I've heard it said. I, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, I, I can't think way back there, but I, I probably said that myself somewhere way back there. But here is, here is a, 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 another thing in that is uh, that we are not to cope with fear. Just keep it one half a step in front of it. No, no, God didn't call us to cope. God, God called us into the liberty and freedom that Christ has provided for us. So we're not coping, but we're standing on the word of God, standing on the word that liberates us from attempting to cope and thinking cope is the answer. It's not. Liberation is the answer. Freedom is the answer. Amen. Whom the son has set free is free indeed. What's it? It's free from coping. It's free from doubt, free from unbelief. 
So we're not to cope with these things that God says he's already delivered us from. We're not to cope with that. We are to be liberated from that and walk in freedom where that thing is concerned. Amen. So to cope is a struggle with a problem. You ever have a problem in your life and you struggled with it and one day you think this way about it and the next day you think another way about it and the next day you do something else and trying to cope with it and then the next day you do something different and trying to cope with it. That's not the way it works. That's not the way God wants it to work. It's not the way God intended for it to work. When Jesus came, he came to set you free. He came to set man free. And so to, uh, uh, to cope is to struggle with a problem. In this case, the spirit of fear. That is a problem for people who have embraced the spirit of fear. We are not to cope with it. We are to eliminate that fear, spirit of fear, out of our mind, out of our life, through the word of God, by the spirit of God, and by the power of God. So we see then that, uh, that uh, uh, the way for a believer to conquer fear is with the liberating light of God. Now, I like to read that, read that again. You know, sometimes it takes two or three times reading through it, four or five times, for us to really stop and start to at least give some thought to that. But the way for a believer, if you are a believer in Christ, the way for a believer to conquer fear is with the liberating light of God's word. Now, let me read to you St. John and to, to show you what we're talking about in that statement that I made to you, St. John chapter one, verses three through five. All things were made by him, by God. All things were made by him. He made everything, but what he made in all things is he made everything beautiful, holy, uh, it, it, there's no darkness in it. There's no sin in it. There's no death in it. None of those things. He made all things that are good, all things that are profitable, all things that are blessing to humanity. God made it. And so he says, uh, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. He's the great creator. He created this earth beautiful. He created it, I mean, uh, it, it was flawless in how he created this world. And so somebody said, well, how did it get in this shape? Got in this shape through Adam. He, gave, he created it, and then he looked over what he had created, and he said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And so he needed somebody then to enjoy and to rule and to have authority over what he created, so he created Adam. And out of Adam's side, Adam's rib, he created a helpmeet, which was good for Adam. But what Adam did, he sold that authority and that freedom. Uh, he sold it out when Satan came into the garden and tempted him to eat of the forbidden fruit. He sold, he sold it out. So when, when, when Adam sold it out, it was in, then in, in uh, Satan's possession Darkness then came into the earth. Sin came into the earth. And so we see here, watch this. All things were created or were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life. If you have the life of God in you tonight as a believer, watch what it says. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him, in the one who created all that's good, all that's holy, all that's right, in him, it says, in him was life. You have the life of God in you as a believer. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. We have the light of Almighty God on the inside of us by the Holy Spirit uh, through Christ Jesus. It's in there if you are a believer, if you have received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have the life of God. You have the light of God on the inside of you. Now watch what it says here. It says, and the light, 
that's in you and the light that shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. The, the darkness could not put it out. The darkness could not eliminate it. The, the darkness could not dim the light of God that's on the inside of us. Hallelujah. So we, we are children of the light. We're to walk in the light, the light that God has put on the inside of us. And that light that's in us, that's based upon and talked about in the word of God, that light will put Satan's attempts out. It'll put, it'll put his, his, his schemes and his wiles and his plans and purposes against you and us and humanity. It'll put it out. It'll put it out. Light always overcomes the darkness. So what are we talking about? We're talking about having courage in the face of fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. Trust. Trust in God. Trust his word. Know that he cannot lie. Know that he will not repent of anything that he said, but he will fulfill his word in my life and in your life if you take a hold of it with your faith. And then he gives us his faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It comes out of the word into our mind, into our heart. God gives us everything that is good, that is a blessing, that is beneficial. All of that comes from our heavenly father and he is love. God is love. Thank you once again for being a part of our broadcast today. I'm always grateful to know that you're there and that you're watching and that the Lord is blessing you as you receive the word of the Lord. I want to pray with you uh, before we leave today. Father, I pray for the people. I pray, Lord, that your hand of blessing, your hand of deliverance, your hand that brings good things into their lives will be upon them and that they will receive that which you have provided for them in Christ Jesus and their life will be made better because of those things that you have done and that which they have received by faith from you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thanks again. We always appreciate you being there, as I've already said, and we'll see you next time right here on Victorious Living. You've been watching Victorious Living with Pastor Charles Cowan. It's our hope that today's message has ministered to the need you have in your life. If you would like to receive today's message in its entirety, please call 1-800-842-7896. Or if you're in the Nashville area, call 615-226-2145 and ask for the product number on the screen. Visit us online at victoriousliving.org. If you're ever in the Nashville area, come and worship with us. Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. From Pastor Cowan and the Congregation of Faith is the Victory Church, we'll be looking for you next time right here on Victorious Living.